So we're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. So that brings us uh, into the book of Revelation, where if there's any book that loves to mix the literal and symbolic geography, it's Revelation. Uh, so a few cities that you could do that with uh, in Revelation, Zion. And again, Zion is an interesting, uh, interesting because it stands for a lot of things. It can be confusing. So I'm writing a book on women in the Bible that's due next August. Um, and I'm going to write one of the chapters on symbolic women in the Bible because Zion is one of those. Zion is always depicted as female. So Zion is Jerusalem, but also Mount Zion. Uh, there's Mount Zion, which is equivalent to the city of David uh, in Jerusalem. There's also language of daughters of Zion, right? So it's a very rich, almost overused metaphor uh, to unpack. Um, Okay, so let's talk about Revelation. Let's go back to our churches of Revelation and see where they are and what, what they're with. Texas. Did somebody just say Texas? Yeah. Why? Because you have, because there's, oh, Texas. I thought, you, I thought because Texas names a lot of cities after the Bible. Like when I first got here, I'm like, oh, what's, let's go to Palestine. And then they were like, it's Palestine. I'm like, serious? And uh, there's a Corinth, or, but they call it Corinth. Yeah, I'm like, wow, this is, Texas, I love Texas. Or, I actually really do love Texas, but it's an it's a unusual place in its own way. Um, okay. So, no, I, I do love it. It is, yeah, it's unique and super special. Okay, uh, so what I wanted, again, this is one of the themes I hope that you've heard uh, throughout the day. We've asked about what makes home home. We've asked about what makes a promised land a promised land, and is it real and here, or is it pie in the sky somewhere else, some other millennium? Uh, uh, and we've talked about how at every turn the New Testament for sure envisions a concern for the cosmic, the socio-political, and the personal local level. Uh, uh, and we'll see it also in Revelation. Okay. Um, so, in Revelation, I think I'm not going to take the time to read. Go back and read yourself. Or Google, if you have Bible software, you can go, go see all the places Babylon occurs. But the thing is, Babylon's a bad thing. Rome is associated with Babylon. And the author predicts the downfall of arrogant Rome uh, as part of it. Um, again, we're moving... Uh, Uh, moving to Zion as the goal. I think what, you know what I want to do? All right, I'm going to give you all a break for like two minutes when I pull up something else. All right, so anyway, you get that. So there's the mythic epic that goes in that song, right? We're marching out of Babylon in some way, shape, or form as Christians. We're supposed to be marching out of Babylon and into the beautiful uh, city of God. All right. That's great and wonderful, and I totally affirm that. It's always good to affirm scripture. Um, but what does that look like on the ground? One thing I find fascinating about Revelation is when I talk to people, just strike up a conversation, which can happen, for instance, on a plane. Um, so I was telling somebody I have 13 trips between now and November 26th. So um, I'm on a plane a lot. And when people ask, what do you do for a living? Uh, the conversation could get really interesting. And so when it comes to the book of Revelation, which a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about, it's the book people often go to when they want to do a kind of otherworldly flight of fancy. Right? So where it's like things are so bad here and, you know, but someday in the sweet by and by, way up there on some distant shore, some stuff's going to happen and it's going to be made right. What, a lot of times what people don't know, and what I didn't know until I became a, a student, is that this whole 
whole vision, this whole revelation. The, the name of the book of Revelation in Greek is Apocalypsis. Apocalypsis, which means an unveiling, a revealing. So it means unveiling, revealing. So we translate it as revelation. Sometimes we just leave it in a Bible. It will just be called the Apocalypse of John. We don't even translate it. But what's interesting is this entire 21 chapters of this one vision, because it's actually only one revelation, if you can believe that. There's a lot packed into it, but it's only one. And uh, the students in the room know one thing. So I'm a very loving, accessible, warm, fun person, I think. Um, the only time I get where the students go against me is they have, they, are, they have to name the books of the New Testament in order, spelled correctly, with no errors. I'm gracious on anything and everything except for that. Um, so yeah, so if somebody puts revelations, you don't get partial credit. Um, because this is like scripture. So, um, so know that it is revelation, not revelations. I even went so far as if you know the artist Mary Inglebright, she has a um, she has a piece of art that quotes Revelation about hurt not the earth. It's really really beautiful. And on the bookmark though it says Revelations, whatever. So I like wrote the company. I'm like, whoa, you can't do this. It's one Revelation, but they can't actually change it for copyright and stuff. But all this whole revelation was written to seven real churches in real historical time. So they are these churches, right? Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Smyrna, Ephesus, um, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And you remember um, John is exiled over here on Potmos. And we don't have time to read through each letter but you really, really should. Because again, it shows that he sees his people in the way Bob's talking about. Each of these churches, they're very close to each other. He considers himself their pastor in some way, shape, or form to have authority over them. But each one of them needs its own message. So there are similarities in each one, but some of them, in each church, they're doing some things well, and there's some places they need to step up to the plate. And so again, it's not generic advice for any old Christian, uh, in, right? It's, it's very, very particular. So read through those and see that yes, we're, we're talking about the mythic and the epic, but that always has to be lived out in the local and the practical. For Revelation, again, you'll, when you read it versus hearing somebody talk about it, you think that it's out there. That this whole thing, like I said, is going to hell in a handbasket and we're gonna just go somewhere else. But what you find, again, is that the new heaven and the new earth, they descend, right? And it's really about renewed creation. And getting from Genesis, uh, uh, back to Genesis in a way, but, but after innocence is gone. Genesis, in a way, is about the original Garden of Eden. It's a story about loss of innocence and being children in a garden. By the time, if you've read the whole canon and you get to the end of Revelation, it's hoped that yes, yes, we we want to get back to full, you know, overcome alienation, but in a mature, not naive kind of way. And if you read in between Genesis and Revelation, and we take it all seriously, the goal is our Christian maturation. So understand that for Revelation, heaven and earth meet here. Again, I mean, you might as well just say it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Might as well finish it. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, so he, one of the things he says repeatedly in the letters is, I know where you live. And then he goes on to describe the reality and the challenges that each Christian congregation uh, is dealing with. So let's read one as an example. We read one where they're doing well or 
So everybody's got something they're doing well. And the, the vision itself, when you read the opening of Revelation, which starts the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So the author, first of all, when you read that, um, when you hear that this is prophecy, again, if you know nothing about Christianity or whatever, you might think, oh, Nostradamus, you know, this kind of thing. But as uh, Christians who know their Old Testament, when somebody's writing prophecy, what are you going to expect it to say in effect? Right, and usually what are they going to say? Straighten up. <laughs> right, and it's straighten up. You already said it earlier. Like, take care of the widows, take care of the widows and the orphans, whatever. But the pro so it's prophecy. This is the first problem people have when they read Revelation. They think of prophecy as some kind of just fortune telling or like telling the future. And it is true for Christians and Jews, prophecy is that in a way because it says if you keep on doing this, this is what's going to happen because guess what? Anytime people do this, that's what happens. But anytime people choose to live this way, this is what happens. So in that way, yes, it's telling the future. Um, so because you know the Old Testament, when you read this, you're like, uh-oh, these people are about ready to get a word uh, of encouragement, but also a word of challenge. And they do. So it says, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and was and is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Um, so again, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He is speaking these words into an, ocu to, to an imperial setting, where Rome is running around trying to say, it's the Savior, it's bringing peace, it deserves to be worshipped. This is already a subversive political act about who has dominion, despite how things appear. There is a reality that you might not see if you're not looking in the right way, using the right categories. So he goes on then. Um, let's just see um, his message to, let's just read Laodicea because that's always fun. Um, and to the angel, and this is uh, 3.14, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. So because you're a lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You don't realize you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white robes to clothe you and keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come to you and eat with you and you with me. Um, to the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself have conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So it's a pattern that gets followed um, throughout. Okay, uh, what I want to do now is um, uh, two things. So what you find then in, in Revelation is a strong resistance to the way Rome acts. Uh, and you see a call to Christian values and to not be tempted away from those. So what I would say you find in, in Revelation, ironically, it's not about um, scary things, just like saving people, you better get saved or you're going to hell. This is actually a book of hope. It's a book that is in some ways unlike, unlike any other documents we have because it's in the genre of apocalyptic that uses these bizarre images and forms to impress something upon us. Right, so it's weird. There are a lot of apocalypses you can read that don't make the canon. This is the only one that did, so it strikes us as weird if we haven't read beyond the canon. Okay, so on the one hand, it's weird that way. On the other hand, Revelation says nothing that you can't find in the rest of your scriptures. And what it finally is about 
is uh, talking about a geography of justice and peace, of healing and wholeness and hope. That's what this book is for. It's not trying to scare non-Christians into believing or they're going to hell. It's trying to encourage Christians to keep being faithful even when it's really hard. And to keep being hopeful even when hope seems kind of foolish and silly. As part of it, I mean, it knows how people are. And so I highly recommend, so when we go to the Holy Land, this is one little book I like. So my friend Monty Luker wrote this book, An Illustrated Guide to the Holy Land for Tour Group Students and Pilgrims. And he has a section in here on Har Megiddo. And if I could pull up my slides... So there's Megiddo, and so you, go, you do go on a mountain, Mount Megiddo, and you overlook a big uh, valley. And in Revelation 16, we hear this. You overlook the Jezreel Valley, where two important roads meet. And so what happens is this is a valley that has seen endless bloodshed. I don't remember the number, but the number of battles that have been fought on this plain are practically innumerable. And if you read Monty's little entry, even in here on it, he will show you, even in the Old Testament, battles that took place. Also the story of Deborah, Jael, the Sisera, the tent stake through the head, uh, all of that uh, goes on there. So it is a place that has known nothing but endless bloodshed about it. Blood soaking up that earth um, is phenomenal. So it is not surprising then in the geography of the biblical author's mind when you're depicting a place where the final battle is going to happen, you're going to pick the place where all the battles have happened, right? And so it is a real place. You can go there. It's a valley that's had real battles. But you can see how it lends itself to the mythic, epic nature that the story of Revelation is already telling. Um, So if you look in uh, Revelation 6, 16, 15, and 16. See, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and is clothed, not going about naked and exposed to shame. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So if you're doing Bible study, uh, leading Bible study, uh, I would have you help people tour the book of Revelation and tie it in with the geography that will then ground them in what the book was trying to do in its original purpose. In some ways it's been co-opted and used even in ways that go against um, what the author is trying to do and it becomes a book of fear and not a book of hope. So I want to close us um, with the end of, of Revelation itself. I also wanted to flag for you Revelation 14.1, where you have the Lamb who's on Mount Zion. 14.1, then I looked and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. Okay, so, um, summarizing this. John, um, the author of John, of Revelation, who's named John, probably not, not the same author who wrote the Gospel of John, could never write Romans 13. Uh, because the author of Revelation has nothing good to say about the destructive, gluttonous, warmongering empire. Uh, in other ways, he does share some of Paul's sentiments, such as, it matters to live faithfully in your particular neck of the woods as a community, to witness to hope and justice. Second, heaven and earth belong together. This earth, homeland of all we love, as the poet I opened with, John Daniels, said uh, this morning. Revelation is like Genesis in that the story is told in mythic time and in a utopia of sorts. Not a utopia that's the disinterested, we're never going to get there, be depressed, right? But it's, it's not a particular place, it's every place, a not place. Um, it is uh, not utopian insofar as, right, we expect this to happen and we expect to be participants in it. We have been gifted with the Holy Spirit to do so. The answer, the word you'll see throughout Revelation is this word hupomone, H-Y-P-O-M-O-N-E. Hupomone means patient endurance. That's the key, patient 
endurance and not selling out to the values of idolatrous, greedy, destructive empire that destroys the earth for sordid gain and luxurious living. Revelation is not some futuristic drama. It is a revelation. It is about the truth of the world we inhabit now and the gap that needs to be bridged so that it can be done on earth as it is in heaven. The new heaven and the new earth takes us back to the creation narrative that we started with. So in Revelation 21, 1 to 6, you hear this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is where? Among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In creation, God spoke a word that creates. In Revelation, Jesus speaks words that create. Creation, in Genesis, we heard the tree of life, right? In, Re in Revelation, creation is restored, and we see a tree of life. Reading um, Revelation 22, 1 and 2. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life. So we have seen Rome and Babylon, literal and symbolic. Jerusalem, Zion, literal and symbolic. Armageddon, and Har Megiddo, literal and symbolic. You must have both to understand the deep truths about reality that the text is showing us with its language of geography and the life of faith to which we are called as Christians in a world that on the one hand makes hopeful faith and patient endurance seem naive, but on the other hand has proven that they are in fact the only solid practical truths that have ever worked. So let us march to beautiful Zion together with hopeful faith and patient endurance and the sure conviction that God keeps God's promises, that the new Jerusalem beckons us where it will be on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you. Thank you.